Chapter fifty four of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter fifty four the inscription set upon the great gate of telem here enter not vile bigots hypocrites externally devoted apes base knights puffed up wry-necked beasts worse than the huns or ostrogoths forerunners of baboons cursed snakes dissembled varlets seeming sancts slipshod cafards beggars pretending wants fat chuffcats smell-feast knockers doltish gulls outstrouting cluster fists contentious bulls fomenters of divisions and debates elsewhere not here make sale of your deceits your filthy tramperies stuffed with pernicious lies not worth a bubble would do but trouble our earthly paradise your filthy tramperies here enter not attorneys barristers nor bridal champing law practitioners clerks commissaries scribes nor pharisees wilful disturbers of the people's ease judges destroyers with an unjust breath of honest men like dogs even unto death your salary is at the gibbet foot go drink there for we do not here fly out on those excessive courses which may draw a waiting on your courts by suits in law lawsuits debates and wrangling hence are exiled and jangling here we are very frolic and merry and free from all entangling lawsuits debates and wrangling here enter not base pinching usurers pelf-lickers everlasting gatherers gold graspers coin gripers gulpers of mists niggish deformed sots who though your chests vast sums of money should to you afford would ne'ertheless add more unto that hoard and yet not be content you clunch fist dastards insatiable fiends and pluto's bastards greedy devourers chichi sneak-bill rogues hell mastiffs gnaw your bones you ravenous dogs you beastly looking fellows reason doth plainly tell us that we should not to you allot room here but at the gallows you beastly looking fellows here enter not fond makers of demurs in love adventures peevish jealous curs sad pensive dotards razors of garboils hags goblins ghosts firebrands of household broils nor drunkards liars cowards cheaters clowns thieves cannibals faces or cast with frowns nor lazy slugs envious covetous nor blockish cruel nor too credulous here mangy pocky folks shall have no place no ugly lusks nor persons of disgrace 
grace honour praise delight here sojourn day and night sound bodies lined with a good mind do here pursue with might grace honour praise delight here enter you and welcome from our hearts all noble sparks endowed with gallant parts this is the glorious place which bravely shall afford wherewith to entertain you all were you a thousand here you shall not want for anything for what you'll ask we'll grant stay here you lively jovial handsome brisk gay witty frolic cheerful merry frisk spruce jocund courteous furtherers of trades and in a word all worthy gentle blades blades of heroic breasts shall taste here of the feasts both privily and civilly of the celestial guests blades of heroic breasts here enter you pure honest faithful true expounders of the scriptures old and new whose glosses do not blind our reason but make it to see the clearer and who shut its passages from hatred avarice pride factions covenants and all sort of vice come settle here a charitable faith which neighbourly affection nourisheth and whose light chaseth all corrupters hence of the blessed word from the aforesaid sense the holy sacred word may it always afford to us all in common both man and woman a spiritual shield and sword the holy sacred word here enter you all ladies of high birth delicious stately charming full of mirth ingenious lovely mignard proper fair magnetic graceful splendid pleasant rare obliging sprightly virtuous young solacious kind neat quick feet bright compt ripe choice dear precious alluring courtly comely fine complete wise personable ravishing and sweet come joys enjoy the lord celestial hath given enough wherewith to please us all gold give us god forgive us and from all woes relieve us that we the treasure may reap of pleasure and shun whate'er is grievous gold give us god forgive us End of chapter 54 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 55 of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book I, by François Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart Chapter 55 What manner of dwelling the Telemites had 
in the middle of the lower court there was a stately fountain of fair alabaster upon the top thereof stood the three graces with their cornucopias or horns of abundance and did jet out the water at their breasts mouth ears eyes and other open passages of the body the inside of the buildings in this lower court stood upon great pillars of chalcedony stone and porphyry marble made archways after a goodly antique fashion within those were spacious galleries long and large adorned with curious pictures the horns of bucks and unicorns with rhinoceroses water horses called hippopotames the teeth and tusks of elephants and other things well worth the beholding the lodging of the ladies for so we may call those gallant women took up all from the tower arctic unto the gate mesembrine the men possessed the rest before the said lodging of the ladies that they might have their recreation between the two first towers on the outside were placed the tilt yard the barriers or lists for tournaments the hippodrome or riding court the theatre or public playhouse and natatory or place to swim in with most admirable baths in three stages situated above one another well furnished with all necessary accommodation and store of myrtle water by the river-side was the fair garden of pleasure and in the midst of that the glorious labyrinth between the two other towers were the courts for the tennis and the balloon towards the tower criere stood the orchard full of all fruit trees set and ranged in a quincuncial order at the end of that was the great park abounding with all sort of venison betwixt the third couple of towers were the butts and marks for shooting with a snapwork gun an ordinary bow for common archery or with a crossbow the office houses were without the tower hesperia of one story high the stables were beyond the offices and before them stood the falconry managed by ostrich keepers and falconers very expert in the art and it was yearly supplied and furnished by the candians venetians sarmates now called muscoviters with all sorts of most excellent hawks eagles gerfalcons goshawks sacras lanners falcons sparrow-hawks marlins and other kinds of them so gentle and perfectly well manned that flying of themselves sometimes from the castle for their own disport they would not fail to catch whatever they encountered the venery where the beagles and hounds were kept was a little farther off drawing towards the park all the halls chambers and closets or cabinets were richly hung with tapestry and hangings of divers sorts according to the variety of the seasons of the year all the pavements and floors were covered with green cloth the beds were all embroidered in every back chamber or withdrawing room there was a looking glass of pure crystal set in a frame of fine gold garnished all about with pearls and was of such greatness that it would represent to the full the whole lineaments and proportion of the person that stood before it 
at the going out of the halls which belong to the ladies lodgings where the perfumers and trimmers through whose hands the gallants passed when they were to visit the ladies those sweet artificers did every morning furnish the ladies chambers with the spirit of roses orange flower water and angelica and to each of them gave a little precious casket vapouring forth the most odoriferous exhalations of the choicest aromatical scents end of chapter fifty five recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter fifty six of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by martin geeson gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter fifty six. How the men and women of the religious order of Telem were apparelled. The ladies at the foundation of this order were apparelled after their own pleasure and liking. But since that of their own accord and free will they have reformed themselves, their accoutrement is in manner as followeth they wore stockings of scarlet crimson or ingrained purple dye which reached just three inches above the knee having a list beautified with exquisite embroideries and rare incisions of the cutter's art their garters were of the colour of their bracelets and circled the knee a little both over and under their shoes pumps and slippers were either of red violet or crimson velvet pinked and jagged like lobster waddles next to their smock they put on the pretty kirtle or vasquin of pure silk camlet above that went the taffety or tabby farthingale of white red tawny grey or of any other colour above this taffety petticoat they had another of cloth of tissue or brocade embroidered with fine gold and interlaced with needlework or as they thought good and according to the temperature and disposition of the weather had their upper coats of satin damask or velvet and those either orange tawny green ash-coloured blue yellow bright red crimson or white and so forth or had them of cloth of gold cloth of silver or some other choice stuff enriched with pearl or embroidered according to the dignity of the festival days and times wherein they wore them their gowns being still correspondent to the season were either of cloth of gold frizzled with a silver raised work of red satin covered with gold pearl of tabby or taffety white blue black tawny etc of silk serge silk camlet velvet cloth of silver silver tissue cloth of gold gold wire figured velvet or figured satin tinselled and overcast with golden threads in divers variously purfled draughts 
in the summer some days instead of gowns they wore light handsome mantles made either of the stuff of the aforesaid attire or like moresco rugs of violet velvet frizzled with a raised work of gold upon silver pearl or with a knotted cordwork of gold embroidery everywhere garnished with little indian pearls they always carried a fair panache or plume of feathers of the colour of their muff bravely adorned and tricked out with glistering spangles of gold in the winter time they had their taffety gowns of all colours as above named and those lined with the rich furrings of hind wolves or speckled lynxes black spotted weasels martlet skins of calabria sables and other costly furs of an inestimable value their beads rings bracelets collars carcanets and neck chains were all of precious stones such as carbuncles rubies balius diamonds sapphires emeralds turquoise garnets agates burials and excellent marguerites their head-dressing also varied with the season of the year according to which they decked themselves in winter it was of the french fashion in the spring of the spanish in summer of the fashion of tuscany except only upon the holy days and sundays at which times they were accoutred in the french mode because they accounted it more honourable and better befitting the garb of a matronal pudicity the men were apparelled after their fashion their stockings were of tamin or of cloth serge of white black scarlet or some other ingrained colour their breeches were of velvet of the same colour with their stockings or very near embroidered and cut according to their fancy their doublet was of cloth of gold or of cloth of silver of velvet satin damask taffeties etc of the same colours cut embroidered and suitably trimmed up in perfection the points were of silk of the same colours the tags were of gold well enamelled their coats and jerkins were of cloth of gold cloth of silver gold tissue or velvet embroidered as they thought fit their gowns were every whit as costly as those of the ladies their girdles were of silks of the colour of their doublets every one had a gallant sword by his side the hilt and handle whereof were gilt and the scabbard of velvet of the colour of his breeches with a chape of gold and pure goldsmith's work the dagger was of the same their caps or bonnets were of black velvet adorned with jewels and buttons of gold upon that they wore a white plume most prettily and minion-like parted by so many rows of gold spangles at the end whereof hung dangling in a more sparkling resplendency fair rubies emeralds diamonds etc but there was such a sympathy between the gallants and the ladies that every day they were apparelled in the same livery and that they might not miss there were certain gentlemen appointed to tell the youths every morning what vestments the ladies would on that day wear for all was done according to the pleasure of the ladies in these so handsome clothes and habiliments so rich think not that either one or other of either sex did waste any time at all 
for the masters of the wardrobes had all their raiments and apparel so ready for every morning and the chamber ladies so well skilled that in a trice they would be dressed and completely in their clothes from head to foot and to have those accoutrements with the more conveniency there was about the wood of telem a row of houses of the extent of half a league very neat and cleanly wherein dwelt the goldsmiths lapidaries jewellers embroiderers tailors gold drawers velvet weavers tapestry makers and upholsterers who wrought there every one in his own trade and all for the aforesaid jolly friars and nuns of the new stamp they were furnished with matter and stuff from the hands of the lord nausiclete who every year brought them seven ships from the perlers and cannibal islands laden with ingots of gold with raw silk with pearls and precious stones and if any marguerites called unions began to grow old and lose somewhat of their natural whiteness and lustre those with their art they did renew by tendering them to eat to some pretty cocks as they used to give casting unto hawks end of chapter fifty six recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter fifty seven of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by martin geeson gargantua and pantagruel book one by francois rabelais translated by sir thomas urquhart chapter fifty seven how the telemites were governed and of their manner of living all their life was spent not in laws statutes or rules but according to their own free will and pleasure they rose out of their beds when they thought good they did eat drink labour sleep when they had a mind to it and were disposed for it none did awake them none did offer to constrain them to eat drink nor do any other thing for so had gargantua established it in all their rule and strictest tie of their order there was but this one clause to be observed do what thou wilt because men that are free well-born well-bred and conversant in honest companies have naturally an instinct and spur that prompteth them unto virtuous actions and withdraws them from vice which is called honour those same men when by base subjection and constraint they are brought under and kept down turn aside from that noble disposition by which they formerly were inclined to virtue to shake off and break that bond of servitude wherein they are so tyrannously enslaved for it is agreeable with the nature of man to long after things forbidden and to desire what is denied us by this liberty they entered into a very laudable emulation to do all of them what they saw did please one if any of the gallants or ladies should say let us drink they would all drink if any one of them said let us play they all played if one said let us go a walking into the fields they went all 
if it were to go a hawking or a hunting the ladies mounted upon dainty well-paced nags seated in a stately palfrey saddle carried on their lovely fists mignardly begloved every one of them either a sparrow-hawk or a laneret or a marlin and the young gallants carried the other kinds of hawks so nobly were they taught that there was neither he nor she amongst them but could read write sing play upon several musical instruments speak five or six several languages and compose in them all very quaintly both in verse and prose never were seen so valiant knights so noble and worthy so dexterous and skilful both on foot and a horseback more brisk and lively more nimble and quick or better handling all manner of weapons than they were never were seen ladies so proper and handsome so miniard and dainty less froward or more ready with their hand and with their needle in every honest and free action belonging to that sex than were there for this reason when the time came that any man of the said abbey either at the request of his parents or for some other cause had a mind to go out of it he carried along with him one of the ladies namely her whom he had before that chosen for his mistress and they were married together and if they had formerly in telem lived in good devotion and amity they did continue therein and increase it to a greater height in their state of matrimony and did entertain that mutual love till the very last day of their life in no less vigour and fervency than at the very day of their wedding ah here must not i forget to set down unto you a riddle which was found under the ground as they were laying the foundation of the abbey engraven in a copper plate and it was thus as followeth end of chapter fifty seven recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey chapter fifty eight of gargantua and pantagruel book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Gargantua and Pantagruel, Book One, by Francois Rabelais, translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart. Chapter Fifty Eight: A Prophetic Riddle. Poor mortals who wait for a happy day, cheer up your hearts and hear what I say. If it be lawful firmly to believe that the celestial bodies can give us wisdom to judge of things that are not yet or if from heaven such wisdom we may get as may with confidence make us discourse of years to come their destiny and course i to my hearers give to understand that this next winter though it be at hand yea and before there shall appear a race of men who loath to sit still in one place shall boldly go before all people's eyes suborning men of divers qualities to draw them into covenants and sides in such a manner that whate'er betides they'll move you if you give them ear no doubt with both your friends and kindred to fall out they'll make a vassal to gainstand his lord and children their own parents in a word all reverence shall then be banished no true respect to others shall be had. They'll say that every man should have his turn, both in his going forth and in his return. And hereupon shall there arise such woes, such jarrings, and confused to and froes, 
that never were in history such coils set down as yet, such tumults and garboils. Then shall you many gallant men see by valour stirred up the youthful fervency, who, trusting too much in their hopeful time, live but a while and perish in their prime. Neither shall any who this course shall run leave off the race which he hath once begun, till they the heavens with noise by their contention have filled, and with their steps the earth's dimension. Then those shall have no less authority that have no faith than those that will not lie. For all shall be governed by a rude, base, ignorant, and foolish multitude. The veriest lout of all shall be their judge. O oh, horrible and dangerous deluge! Deluge, I call it, and that for good reason. For this shall be omitted in no season. Nor shall the earth of this foul stir be free. Till suddenly you in great store shall see the waters issue out, with whose streams the most moderate of all shall moistened be, and justly too, because they did not spare the flocks of beasts that innocentest are, but did their sinews and their bowels take, not to the gods a sacrifice to make, but usually to serve themselves for sport. And now consider, I do you exhort, in such commotion so continual, what rest can take the globe terrestrial? Most happy, then, are they that can it hold, and use it carefully as precious gold, by keeping it in gaol, whence it shall have no help but him who being to it gave. And to increase his mournful accident, the sun, before it set in the occident, shall cease to dart upon it any light, more than in an eclipse or in the night, so that at once its favour shall be gone, and liberty with it be left alone. And yet, before it come to ruin thus, its quaking shall be as impetuous as Etna's was when Titan's sons lay under, and yield when lost a fearful sound like thunder. In a rhyme did not more quickly move, when Typhius did the vast huge hills remove, and for despite into the sea them threw. Thus shall it then be lost by ways not few, and change suddenly, when those that have it to other men that after come shall leave it. Then shall it be high time to cease from this so long, so great, so tedious exercise. For the great waters told you now by me will make each think where his retreat will be. And yet, before that, they be clean dispersed. You may behold in the air, where naught was erst, the burning heat of a great flame to rise, lick up the water, and the enterprise. It resteth after those things to declare that those shall sit content who chosen are, with all good things, and with celestial man, nay, and richly recompensed every man. The others at the last all stripped shall be, that after this great work all men shall see, how each shall have his due, this their lot. Oh, he is worthy praise that shrinketh not. No sooner was this enigmatical monument read over, but Gargantua, fetching a very deep sigh, said unto those that stood by, It is not now only, I perceive, that people call to the faith of the gospel, and convinced with the certainty of evangelical truths, are persecuted. But happy is that man that shall not be scandalized, but shall always continue to the end in aiming at the mark which God by his dear Son, hath set before us, without being distracted or diverted by his carnal affections, and depraved nature. The monk then said, What do you think in your conscience is meant and signified by this riddle? What? said Gargantua. The progress and carrying on of the divine truth. By St. Goderin, said the monk, that is not my exposition. It is the style of the prophet Merlin. Make upon it as many grave allegories and glosses as you will, 
and dote upon it, you and the rest of the world, as long as you please. For my part, I can conceive no other meaning in it but a description of a set of tennis, in dark and obscure terms. The suborners of men are the makers of matches, which are commonly friends. After the two chases are made, he that was in the upper end of the tennis court goeth out, and the other cometh in. They believe the first that saith the ball was over or under the line. The waters are the heats that the players take till they sweat again. The cords of the rackets are made of the guts of sheep or goats. The globe terrestrial is the tennis ball. After playing, when the game is done, they refresh themselves before a clear fire and change their shirts, and very willingly they make all good cheer, but most merrily those that have gained. And so, farewell. End of chapter 58 A Prophetical Riddle Recording by Alan Davis Drake End of Gargantua and Pantagruel Book One by Francois Rabelais Translated by Sir Thomas Urquhart